And welcome back, everybody, to this uh, third webinar in this four-part series. Um, as we have done in previous webinars, we'll take questions at the end. And um, there have been a lot of questions that you all have asked, and they've been great ones. So um, I guess I would just encourage you to keep asking. Um, uh, that's extremely helpful, certainly, to the American Wood Council and to me, certainly. Um, there are two questions I answered last week that I need to revisit today, and I will do that um, as we go through this presentation on connections. And just as a reminder, our last webinar in this series is next week, next Wednesday, where we will discuss how loads get into the foundations and uh, some important issues related to foundation design. So with that, um, let's get started. Just a couple of, uh, at this point, reminder slides, I guess, um, that if you're interested in using part of the presentation or you want to copy part of it or uh, use it in some way, um, please seek permission from the American Wood Council. Uh, this is their presentation. In terms of this particular webinar, what we would like for people to be able to do is describe various methods for making connections. Um, we will not focus too much on uh, nailed connections. Most of the discussion today will be focused on mechanical connections of one sort or another. That's primarily because of the loads we're talking about here with high winds. Uh, the second learning objective is to understand how connections are expected to perform and some issues related to uh, loads with those connections. Um, look at, understand various locations in a load path that require sound connections and understand what type of connections might provide, does, do provide, and need the continuity to the foundation. This again, I believe, is a reminder kind of slide. So the basis for today's webinar is the Wood Frame Construction Manual, the 2012 version of it. Um, the information primarily comes from Chapter 3 and the prescriptive provisions, and you see um, appropriate uh, sections in the, in the manual that relate to um, the issues that we talk about in the other webinars and today. There is a design and engineering design chapter in the manual, um, and it is Chapter 2. So where you can't use prescriptive provisions in the manual or uh, where you might just prefer to use uh, an engineered design approach, that information is in Chapter 2 of the Wood Frame Construction Manual. So today, we want to look at connections in two directions, a vertical load path, lateral load path. We did the same thing last week when we looked at load paths. Um, and now, instead of just looking at the load path, we want to spend a little more time focused on those places where we make connections and how we make them and what the loads are. Um, again, we are uh, intending to and need to take the loads from the roof to the ground so that the soil, the ground, dissipates the loads. Um, we're going to use load tables that come from uh, the Wood Frame Construction Manual, and there are copies of them in these slides today, as there have been in previous weeks. So hopefully I can make a good connection, no pun intended, um, with the material and where you might find this information in the manual. And we're going to do this again for both vertical as well as lateral uh, load paths. So just as a reminder, I'm going to pull all of these numbers up. This was uh, what we did last week in terms of uh, looking at a vertical load path. Um, again, this graphic comes from FEMA's Coastal Construction Manual, um, and this is, again, just one load path in many uh, that this particular simple building, um, we need to be concerned about connections for this simple building. We start at the top, and we're going to make the last connection today um, at, the, at the pile to beam connection number five. So we'll look at the spe specifics of these five connections. So we start at the roof. Um, this slide um, I believe we also had last week, so this is uh, just some reminders about what uh, some limitations are in the prescriptive roof system discussion in the manual. Um, in terms of roof framing, 
Uh, this uh, has, op you know, you have open ceiling plans that could eliminate collar ties or ceiling joists. If you have uh, that condition, then you have to have a ridge beam. The roof sheathing has to be fully supported by roof framing members and needs to be supported um, by blocking or edge clips. And when you get wind speeds greater than 130 miles an hour, you must block and nail at panel edges. So those are the, and there are other limitations in this section 3.5, by the way. Uh, these are the ones that I felt were most pertinent uh, to this discussion as well as uh, we don't have, you know, enough time to go into all of the um, limitations and uh, items that are part of the prescriptive methods. So let's look at connector one. So if you recall, the first connection, uh, at least that I called the first point in the load path, was the roof sheathing to connection. Um, the connection um, is typically uh, made with a nail, and there are two loads on this nail. There's an uplift load and there's a lateral load. Now, in, certainly in residential design, we uh, frequently are assuming um, that the roof diaphragm, even though there's a shape to the roof, um, the load is sort of transferred across the roof. So unless you're specifically designing a roof system where this lateral transfer occurs at the ceiling joist level, uh, we're assuming that there's a lateral load transfer uh, from the, the push of the wind towards this roof surface across the rest of the diaphragm, and that's a lateral load. Uh, so there is uplift or withdrawal um, at the sheathing to nail connection, and there's shear in the plane of the roof. Now, because this is a fastener and we're dealing with a piece of sheathing, we need to use um, component and cladding uplift pressures here, and we need to um, look at a small effective wind area and for those of you who do a lot of this design, you know the smallest effective wind area in ASCE 7 anyway that we deal with is 10 square feet or less. So because we're looking at a fastener that is only a few inches on center from its adjacent fastener, then we're looking at a pretty small effective wind area. Um, if we calculate the pressure in that, um, for that small area, and we look at roof edge zone 2, then you see what the calculated pressure would be. And these numbers now are coming from our, um, our example design where wind speeds are 140 miles an hour and uh, where we had defined the building shape last week. So here we have a, a component and cladding pressure of 36 pounds a square foot. Um, if we have hem fur framing, um, and we look at the withdrawal capacity of an eight penny nail, uh, we see what the withdrawal capacity is. And so I'm not going to go through the calculation, but basically uh, it would calculate out as uh, we need these nails spaced 11 inches on center. Um, I sort of said if, you're, if it's down to 11 inches, then we ought to use a six inch spacing on center in roof zone two for small effective wind areas. I'm sure we could have many debates about, well, does that make any sense? Why not just go to 12? But um, So that's what I have selected as the spacing. The lateral load into the diaphragm, so that was the uplift load. The lateral load into the diaphragm, um, I'm bringing a load from the very first webinar of 129 pounds a foot and assuming that we have rafters two feet on center. Um, if you distribute that load along the rafter length, uh, you see what the shear resistance is of in one eight penny nail um, and and we have plenty of shear resistance in the nail, so the nail spacing is going to be set by withdrawal capacity, not shear in the diaphragm. If we look at the tables in the wood frame construction manual about what nail spacings are, and this is table three point ten for our exposure B condition and our 140 mile an hour wind speed. Um, when we have um, hem fur framing, so you see in the second column a rafter, rafter truss framing with a specific gravity of 0.42, which is similar to uh, hem fur uh, timber, lumber. And we're looking at an edge zone with a 24 inch rafter spacing 
Um, here, for 140 miles an hour, the edge and fields, and F mean edge and field of this edge zone, uh, we need eight penny common nails um, at uh, four inches on center. Connection number two is the roof to wall connection. So here we have taken the load um, from the framing into, in, in this case it illustrates as a truss, and these loads again are coming from uh, the two previous webinars. So we have a 248 pound uplift load at this connection. We have a 258 pound load in the direction that is perpendicular to the wall and a 67 pound shear load at this connection in the plane of the wall. So we have loads in three directions at this one particular connector. Now we haven't really spent much time at all in this webinar talking about the differences between components and cladding loads and main point force resisting system loads. Um, here these loads, I'm assuming these loads at the end of this truss to wall connection, this roof to wall connection, are main wind force resisting system um, loads. So they are calculated from um, the overturning moment that I think we did in webinar one uh, to get us a connector load at the end of this truss and those are considered to be, to me, main wind force resisting system loads because they are collecting loads from um, several surfaces, uh, whereas the nail that attaches sheathing to the rafter um, is really only connecting load from the roof surface and really from a small area that is influenced um, by that nail. So these are all main wind force resisting system loads that I'm assuming here. And as a, again, these are loads in, this is a, a connector that uh, is required to resist loads in three uh, dimensions. Now, uh, without getting into whose connectors might you use here and proprietary issues or whatever, um, you see two examples uh, here from a connector catalog uh, that show uh, the resistance of loads. It shows F1 and F2. Um, but what is implied and certainly what the connectors will also do is handle a load in the uplift direction. So there are three uh, loads, uh, three directional loads that go into each one of these connectors. The wood frame um, manual, manual, and you see the table reference at the bottom of the slide here, um, says that the tabulated connections are the greater of lateral and shear connection requirements. And so what you have when you look at the loads in the manual are the tabulated loads that are the greatest of, and then you, you see how they compare them. Um, in, for this particular manufacturer, um, when you have a connector that's handling multiple loads, they insist that there be a unity equation applied to each one of those loads, and that the sum of the design load divided by the allowable load um, is less than one. Um, and when you apply that particular formula, certainly to some extremely high loads, uh, that could be a um, pretty large issue because it could be difficult to find a connector um, in extremely high wind areas anyway that in fact work, which would mean you might need multiple connectors or uh, some other approach. Now in this particular case, I know this manufacturer has worked with some other folks in the industry to see if this equation is really necessary or necessary in its current form, but irrespective of all that work, uh, this, is current, this is what's in their current catalog. And I want to revisit this um, issue of roof diaphragm blocking from last week. Um, I had this graphic up. Uh, with a shear load that comes across uh, the rafters, as at least shown in this picture, um, with the question, so how do we handle shear loads uh, when we only have a rafter attached to a wall? Let me see if I can help here with a pointer. So if we only had a connection uh, that attaches the wall uh, to the rafter here, um, and we don't have a blocking, we don't have any blocking, 
Uh, can we get enough resistance in the shear load direction, in the direction parallel to the plane of the wall, to not require this blocking and this kind of shear resistance? And so I'm not going to answer the question needed or not needed. That's really up for you all to do. Um, this, this design method, um, I think, um, comes primarily from our seismic friends um, trying to resist shear in the plane of the roof. Um, and, but nevertheless, when we get really high wind loads, and certainly rafters or trusses faced pretty far on center, 24 inches or so, um, it is possible certainly to need the kind of resistance that this blocking and this type of connector might provide. So again, I'm not going to answer the question needed or not needed, but that question does come up in many um, roof diaphragm designs, and designs for that matter. Now here's uh, one of the questions that got asked last week that I need to revisit. Um, so a question from webinar two dealt with the difference between a collar tie and a rafter tie. And my answer was, as you might remember, uh, was that I didn't really see much of a difference and that most collar ties or rafter ties were put you know, somewhere in the top third of the roof. Well, in fact, th this issue is dealt with in the wood frame construction manual. There is a difference between collar ties and rafter ties. You see the difference here illustrated in this graphic where collar ties are, in fact, typically located in the upper third of the roof and help, in fact, keep the two rafters tied together to the ridge um, so that they're not separated by, uh, from a high wind or uplift load at that, at that ridge point. Whereas a rafter tie is, in fact, um, intending to keep um, the uh, bottom of the rafters uh, tied together and eliminate um, thrust issues out here between the rafter and the wall. So, um, in fact, there is a difference. And there is um, a, a table in the uh, manual that deals with rafter tie connection adjustments. And this adjustment, um, you will notice, uh, when the, the um, height increases um, of where the uh, rafter tie is, the further it goes up uh, into the roof system, then there is a pretty large adjustment factor uh, to apply uh, because you're trying to resist the moment uh, between the rafter tie and the rafter. So um, know that there is a difference um, and that the wood frame construction manual deals with it provides formulas for calculating this thrust and adjustments uh, so that moments between the, the tie and the rafter uh, don't get too great. All right, let's move to wall systems now in terms of uh, our load path continuity. Um, I believe this slide was also shown last week. The wall systems are covered in section 3.4 of the manual. There are limitations on heights of studs. Uh, limitations on notching of studs so you don't lose too much cross-sectional area. There are requirements for attaching headers to studs to accommodate the loads. Um, there are double top plate splice requirements for the walls. There are sheeting coverage and nailing specified for shear walls and hold downs required at ends of shear walls to resist overturning. All those things are part of the wall systems uh, section. And if you remember, this was a connector that we had uh, between the top wall plate and the wall studs. So again, um, the, this connection could be done uh, a couple of ways. One is a nailed connection like you see on the top left between the sheathing and the double top plate. So uh, that connection could resist uplift potentially as as this rafter tends to be lifted up by wind, it will pull certainly on the mechanical connector you see attached here. And when it does, it's going to create tension in the top plates, which if not secured with um, some method, and this one shows nailing, um, then it would start to separate the two top plates from the studs. 
So this method on the left illustrates a nailing method. This, this one on the right illustrates a mechanical connector again that attaches the two top uh, plates to a wall stud. The third uh, connector that I want to spend a little bit of time on is the window header to exterior wall. We looked at this again last week. Uh, there are mechanical connectors that uh, provide uh, an attachment between the header and the studs that support the header, and uh, that's illustrated here and obviously in this red oval. Um, there are typically multiple loads going on here, I mean loads in multiple directions, so there is an uplift load along the uh, plane or the line of the stud. Um, there are potentially shear wall loads here coming in the plane of the wall, and there are lateral loads that are perpendicular here to the wall uh, that need to be considered as well. The, the, the manual in this particular table has header connection requirements for high winds, and so um, you can see here for 140 miles an hour, there are uplift and lateral load requirements um, you see on the far left-hand column, I've got the, the cursor around it, um, the roof N in feet, and the second column deals with header spans, and then you see um, the loads uh, for various size headers. So remember the conversation I think we had last week was that these headers are basically acting as uh, beams that are carrying an upward vertical load um, in addition to a downward vertical load certainly, um, and so those connectors at the uh, end of the headers need to be able to resist uplift. Uh, you see what the dead load assumption is at the top of this chart, so dead load in this particular case has been considered, um, and, and again in this table to the tune of 15 pounds a square foot. In our example building where we had a roof span of 20 feet, if we interpolated values in that table that I just showed you, uh, we would have an uplift um, load of 634 pounds on the end of that header, and we would have a lateral load that we needed to resist of 592 pounds. There are reductions in the tabular values that were in this table, this table here, there, there are reduction factors that can be applied when you have framing that's away from the corners, so which means you're not in an edge zone or an end zone for uh, where the highest winds are, and you see what those are for uplift and lateral load. So uh, when you're eight feet away from the corners for uplift load, you can take 75% of what's in the table. Um, when you're eight feet away from uh, the corners for lateral loads, you can take 92% of it. Um, so the reduction uh, for being closer to or in the feet of the wall is a consideration here. So now let's uh, follow the load down to the wall to floor framing. We are now down beside the window. Um, here is the window. And again, here is the uplift load, or the plane of the uplift load. And again, we have a load in three directions. We have an uplift load of 128 pounds, a lateral load of 172, and a shear load of 145 um, at that particular connection. It is um, connection number four. It's uh, load connect path connection number four. And these loads are um, shown in the manual in Table 3.2. Um, now we have a pile foundation in this particular example, and um, after you know many discussions with lots of people, in various parts of the industry, including those from the American Wood Council, um, you know I guess I feel like at least for the kind of floor framing system uh, that we're talking about, these loads are. Um, close to or we should use or could use these sill or bottom plate to foundation connection loads uh, for wind when we have an elevated foundation. So um, here is in the red uh, boxes are our um, example problem conditions. We have a roof and one floor system with a 20-foot roof span 
and we have 140 mile an hour wind speed, and our uplift load um, is 96 pounds, and our shear load is 218 pounds, um, and that is um, adjusted for the spacing of the studs and the size of the buildings to give us the loads that are replicated here in uh, connection number four. And this is how I got them. So uh, the uplift loads are adjusted for stud spacing, and the shear load is adjusted or multiplied by the aspect ratio times stud spacing. And so that's how I got the 96 and 218 pounds to um, be the uplift and shear loads that were shown on the diagram. The lateral loads at the floor system uh, come from table 3.5. So this basically comes from the collection of wind um, to the wall surface perpendicular to the wall surface. And this lateral load um, at that connection is 129 pounds a linear foot when we have a wall height of 10 feet and a wind speed of 140. So the lateral load at the stud is calculated at the bottom obviously adjusted for a 16 inch stud spacing. So lateral loads at the, at the floor, at the bottom of the wall to floor connection, again, are in three um, directions. And then we have to take those loads from the floor system and take them into the pile. Um, so here, we are um, basically multiplying or adjusting the loads that were at the load path for the wall to floor system, which were right here, uh, now based on the pile spacing. And so um, in this particular case, this, in what you see obviously is a bolted connection. This bolted connection between the beam or the girder um, has to be able to resist the collection of loads uh, that come to that point. And in our particular um, example, this is uh, load path connection number five. So at the floor support beam, we are summing the uplift loads over the floor beam span. Um, you could include the weight of the floor system to reduce the uplift, but when you get to the floor systems, those are not included in the uplift loads at the wood in the wood frame construction manual, uh, primarily because I think the manual didn't didn't want to assume and couldn't really assume exactly how the floor system would would be dis the the loads in the floor system would be distributed. So um, the weight of the floor system is not included in reducing the uplift, but you could include it uh, depending on how the floor system is framed. The lateral loads from the, from the load path location number four are summed over the beam span. The shear loads, are we handle those the same way. The connection at the floor support beam to pile isn't covered in the wood frame construction manual um, or really anywhere else that I have found it in any prescriptive literature. So uh, you have to do a little bit of design work to accumulate those loads um, at the floor support beam uh, to uh, determine what the connection into a pile would need to be. And so again, this is connection point number five um, in our little load path example. So these are the results um, which uh, were shown on the graphic. When you have a beam span that's 10 feet or in this case a pile spacing that's 10 feet, uh, the sum of the loads for uplift, lateral, and shear are shown here on the slide. There are several other ways to make this floor to foundation connection. Um, you see them here. This Again, this uh, graphic comes from the um, FEMA's Coastal Construction Manual. You see uh, other alternatives for attaching uh, floor joists and band boards to piles and girders, obviously depends on whether the floor is framed perpendicular to um, the pile system and the girders are framed parallel to, 
obviously it makes a big difference. So now let's look at our lateral load path here for a minute. So we have, um, I'll just point all this out. So what we have is a shear wall, um, a way to collect um, the lateral loads that in this particular case, um, and last week we had an arrow pointing uh, right here, pushing uh, this wall over. Whoops, sorry. So the um, deflected shape um, looks something like the dashed red lines here. And when we push the wall from left to right, then we get a tension load in the left-hand corner and a compression load in the right-hand corner. I think we had this um, graphic up last week as well. So we, we are collecting loads um, in the face of the wall or roof, um, shown with the blue arrows um, right here. That wall, that collection of loads is then taken into a diaphragm, a roof or a floor, as shown here with this larger blue arrow. And when that load is collected along this dimension B, um, it is taken or distributed into this shear wall that I've got the pointer circling at the moment. The way we find the loads in the shear wall is we accumulate the loads that occur at this point and we distribute that load along wherever we have shear capacity. In segmented shear walls, it's along the length of the segments, and in a perforated shear wall, it's along the length of the perforated wall. And that turns out to be some number of pounds up here at the top of the wall, and some number of pounds per foot here at the bottom of the wall. The tension and compression loads are the unit um, shear times the height of the wall. Um, and that is shown here in this formula down at the bottom of the slide. So connections in lateral load paths require um, a couple of um, um, notions. One is we have to nail the sheathing on the shear wall to resist racking. Uh, we have tables of of resistances of pounds per linear foot based on sheathing uh, thicknesses and nailing uh, spacing to give us that resistance. And then the racking movement that creates tension at the left corner and compression at the right is resisted by tie downs or hold downs. And the, the elements of the shear wall that we showed in a graphic a second ago the nailing is, is illustrated or intended to be illustrated by um, connection number one, if you will, and the tension and compression on the two corners is intended to be um, shown with uh, 2T and 2C uh, to illustrate tension and compression. The shear capacities for wood frame diaphragms, here's a table of these shear capacities. Um, and this particular table shows both seismic and wind. Um, we're obviously only dealing with wind in this webinar, and so I put a little um, cross lines through the seismic table. But in this table, um, there are resistances in pounds per linear foot. So hopefully most people can read this. Um, you can see the nail spacing of um, and various load cases here. So let me see if I can um, read this. So where we have nail spacing at diaphragm boundaries at continuous panel edges and then there are load cases and at all panel edges and you can see here uh, the spacing of six inches, four inches, two and a half and two inches. And here is nail spacing at other panel edges, and you see those load cases there. Um, then, and you see the resistance. So as you get um, more nails in the panel, so the closer the spacing, the capacities go up, of course. Again, these are in pounds per linear foot. And um, they are uh, attached to, if you will, the size of the nail over here on the left, and the thickness of the panel. 
So um, this is a um, good test, if you will, of what the nailing capacities are in some of the prescriptive tables that we have in the wood frame construction manual. So I just, in order to illustrate this, uh, for an eight penny nail that's three eighths, three eighths of an inch thick, nailed into a two inch wide framing uh, with nails six inches on center, um, we should be able to resist 755 pounds per linear foot of shear, which is shown right here. There are a couple of shear wall methods, and this is another question that I need to revisit from last week. Um, I think in a senior moment, um, I actually flipped uh, the definition, if you will, of segmented and perforated shear walls. Um, so I apologize for that. I uh, intend to correct that here in a second. So there are three basic methods. I'm not going to talk at all about the shear transfer around openings method because I don't even know of anybody who uses it. Um, and I've only seen it demonstrated in workshops and uh, technical meetings. Um, but there are two other methods that are frequently used, and we'll talk about those in a second. Um, and you can use wood structural panels for both shear and uplift, and there are tables of values that can be used for that. Um, I would refer you to the seismic and wind commentary provided by the um, American Wood Council because there's a lot of additional information about uh, detailing and issues relevant to high wind and seismic design in the commentary that are not in or that are articulated in more detail uh, in the wood frame construction manual. So here is a, a table of segmented shear wall sheathing requirements. So if you had a segmented shear wall, and a segmented shear wall is a, a wall that has segments to it, uh, where you have full, light, full height sheathing in um, areas of the wall that are primarily on either side of windows and doors or corners. Um, every place there's a window or a door is not where you would have full height sheathing. And I think as described last week, in each of those segments, you would have to have a tension and compression connector in addition to shear capacity in the panel. And I have an illustration here in a second. But when you have a segmented shear wall for 140 mile an hour wind speed, where you have building dimensions of 20 feet and 40 feet, which are what is highlighted here with the red circles, for a 20 foot building dimension, you would need full height sheathing at least for five feet for 140 mile an hour wind speeds. And for a 40 foot high, um, surprisingly, uh, this is twice what it was for a 20 foot segment. So here for a 40 foot long wall, you would need 10 feet roughly of full height sheathing in order to resist um, the shear in a segmented shear wall for 140 miles an hour in exposure B. Companion table shows you what the, the wall, the shear wall hold down capacity has to be. For various wall heights for wind and seismic requirements. And so down at the bottom of this slide for webinar number one where we had shear along a 20 foot side of the building, um, that shear was 436 pounds a linear foot and this is where that came from. Four hundred and uh, 36 pounds a foot, um, where the, a wall that's 10 feet high, it requires a hold down of 4,360 pounds. There's your 4,360 pound hold down capacity shown in the table. So um, table 3.17F uh, gives you the shear wall hold down requirements. Here is our segmented shear wall. I think we might have seen this graphic last week as well. So again, this comes from the wood frame construction manual, so pay no attention really to the values that are on here. But in this particular case, these are the segments. A three foot wide segment at this corner, a three foot wide segment at this corner on the left, and a six foot wide segment in the center. And we basically discount the shear resistance of anything in between those segments because they've got windows in them. And in this particular case, um, we would take a 7,175 pound of force on this right-hand corner 
and we would distribute it across uh, 12 feet of segmented wall, 3 foot, 6 foot, 3 foot, all added up. So the shear resistance, this V value here in the wall, um, would be 7,175 pounds divided by 12. There are um, aspect ratios that are uh, maximums. And I think this question was asked last week, and I needed a little help from um, the American Wood Council staff. And so they, I think they uh, answered this question for us. Here's the maximum ratio of a, um, a, a blocked and unblocked wall panel. Um, and I think the answer for wind basically was, assuming a blocked panel, the maximum ratio is 3.5 to 1. This, uh, again, is covered and discussed in the uh, wind and seismic provisions uh, that were developed in 2008 by the, by the Wood Council. Shear wall hold down looks like this. This is a relatively, um, not complicated connector, but it has a lot of parts. And obviously, the higher the loads, the bigger this connector is. It's intended to resist the load at the corner or, in the case of a segmented wall, near the edge of a window or a door. Um, there are a lot of screws in it. Um, there are requirements for the size of the corner. So in some cases, depending on the, on the uh, capacity of the hold down, there will be a requirement about um, what the thickness of this block needs to be. And in some cases, there could be a requirement that this be a 2 by 6 uh, stud, not a 2 by 4 stud, again, depending on the capacity. These hold downs are intended to take this load that is um, either being lifted up in, in the case of tension or pushed down, obviously, in the case of compression. It's intended to take this load and take it to the next level below. And so these connectors, these hold down connectors, have to be installed in a way that you can actually get a bolt um, and a connector through this bottom plate and into uh, the top of the connector below. And so there is a fair amount of a fiddling, if you will, with these things in actual construction um, because Murphy's Law typically applies and many of these things don't actually line up all that well sometimes without a lot of pre-planning. So um, this uh, hold down connector uh, can be pretty um, uh, complicated to install just depending on the situation. This is an actual connector. Um, and you see um, in a picture that I tried to describe a second ago um, how you have to line them up. So in the case of the right-hand side, you know, we have tension or compression coming uh, into this part of the frame. And we are carrying that tension and compression from one floor to the next in this particular graphic. This is a perforated shear wall. So in this particular case, and perforated shear wall means you're going to now use all of the wall that you have to assist in the resistance of shear, except for the openings, of course. Um, and here, uh, the advantage is that you can eliminate all the hold downs at every segment and now only have hold downs at the corners. And so here you have a hold down on each end to resist the overturning and the tension and compression. There are tables of perforated shear wall um, lengths and percents that are in the wood frame construction manual. This table um, gives you the percent of full height sheeting um, on a shear wall and for a segmented shear wall and then adjusts it for perforated shear walls. So, um, you can see you don't need, if you had a 100% shear wall, segmented shear wall that was sheathed, you of course don't need to adjust that for perfor perforated walls because um, there's, no per there's no holes in the shear wall, so there's no perforation adjustment necessary. But you can see depending on um, how um, little of a segmented shear wall is sheathed, so if you look uh, from 100%, down to 10%, and you look across the table at the heights of the openings, then this adjustment factor goes up quite a bit. 
and this particular table and the notes with the table uh, tell the user um, how to apply um, those adjustment factors. And then um, I mentioned that wall sheathing can be used for both shear and uplift. So, uh, yeah. So this, these red lines here, if you will, sort of um, envelope the building that we had as an example um, at 140 miles an hour. Um, you can see what the, the spacings are and what the maximum roof spans are, um, depending on what the nailing and pattern is. Typically, uh, without, without going into great detail here, you, you see that there are one and two rows of nails that you might possibly have to install. And you can see that you can get nail spacings that are pretty close together in order to handle um, high winds depending on the roof span. And so in order to use sheathing in accordance with this method uh, for both uplift and shear, then you, you, you are likely to consider um, more than one stud at the panel edges um, potentially and maybe more than one bottom plate potentially in order to be able to get enough nails between the sheathing and the plates uh, so that uh, you're not tearing up the wood or that there's enough um, uh, OSB or plywood sheathing um, thickness and width uh, in order to be able to get all these nails in there. But it, it certainly can be done and you know might be uh, an acceptable way to uh, resist both shear and uplift at the lower wind speeds of 110 to maybe 120 miles an hour. So with that, it looks like we've got about five minutes left. Um, why don't we uh, take some questions? And um, OK. Bill, can you hear me now? I can. I apologize to those for the delay. I was muted on my end. OK, some questions then. Are blocked or unblocked diaphragms assumed in the wood frame construction manual? Um, there are unblocked diaphragms that are assumed for roof and floor diaphragms. Um, for lateral bracing, for shear walls, there are tables for both blocked and unblocked diaphragms. Um, as one might imagine, you're going to get higher capacities, higher loads in those shear walls that have blocked diaphragms in them. Um, but there are uh, results, if you will, tabular results for uh, both blocked and unblocked. The other thing I'll mention about diaphragms that I didn't mention is I'm pretty sure that in the manual um, there is some discussion too about which way um, the uh, sheathing can be oriented. And I'm also pretty sure you can orient it in either direction um, and there are notes in the tables uh, about that particular issue. And I know it's come up in the field. I've had contractors ask me about it. So. Okay. Another question. You showed that link number five, the connection between the beam and pile, is not covered by the wood frame construction manual. But is the design then of the pile or of the beam? Uh, no. The, the, neither the pile nor the beam is covered in the wood frame construction manual. There are... Um, the pile's not covered at all anywhere that I know of in a prescriptive table anywhere. So most of the pile information, we'll talk about this next week, is going to come from some design guide um, at, you know, practitioners would need to use. The beam um, information could potentially come from prescriptive information from say places like, I know it exists uh, or is similar to beams that are in the Southern Forest Products Association um, elevated floor design guidance because the, the, the way in which the loads are carried is similar. 
um, it could be taken from uh, header designs or some other method where you get the same loads and where you're spanning you know many feet between floors but obviously you have to make sure you consider or have considered all the loads that are coming into a beam like that um, in order before you just jump into some prescriptive table so the answer generally is no but there are some ways to get to some of the answers potentially Okay. Um, let me make, while there's some other questions coming in, let me make one other comment that did come up from last week. And we talked, there was a question, I think, um, about um, nails and capacities of nails and the, the uh, comparison of capacities of eight penny, I mean, uh, of box or common nails compared to um, nails used for in pneumatic equipment. Um, there is um, an evaluation service report from the ICC. The number is 1539, um, and I'm told, and I haven't looked at that document in a long time. I'm told that it's pretty comprehensive and has got a really good list of lateral and withdrawal values of various staples and nails and diaphragm and shear wall values for nails that would be used in pneumatic equipment. So for those who um, have a question and or a need for that, and I would suspect a lot of us do, then look at ESR1539. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, that's fine. Okay. Well, lacking other questions, thank you once again for joining us. For questions that weren't answered during the webinar, we'll make every effort to follow up with your uh, question via email. Also note that the wood frame construction commentary is now available on the uh, AWC website as a free download. There will be a follow-up email, I mentioned that earlier, that will have important information regarding the feedback survey, presentation links, and information on the certificates. Please respond to the survey as your feedback is important to us. We hope that you'll be joining us for the continuation of this topic on the dates shown here. We also have added two new topics to our schedule November 21st, Prescriptive Residential Wood Deck Construction Guide that's uh, referred to us as DCA6 and on January 16th AWC's Code Conforming Wood Design. Please see our website for more information. Once again, thank you and have a good day.